get started with the service here this morning. Done been thankful to be here. Appreciate Leon standing in uh, for Brother Gary this morning. I appreciate these men that God has given us here at Floyd County to stand in and, and handle the Word of God. I'm thankful for that. Please remember Brother Gary, he got awful sick last night, been up last night, and he's just sick and weak, so pray for him. Continue to pray for Laura May, lift her up to the Lord, and uh, just call her name out, Lord, how she needs prayer. And uh, try to go by and see her by her view. She, uh, a little bit before dinner of our yesterday. She is very, very weak, very uh, hurting a lot. She just kind of nod off there while I was talking to her, so I didn't stay long. Just remember her in prayer. Pray for that family. Remember each other. Pray for the service here today. We've got an exciting service. I'm so excited about it. We've got Alyssa here with us and got Brandon. And they're both going to be sharing their testimony. Brandon's going to be preaching. He can incorporate that however he wants to. I just know he'll follow the Lord and I'm trusting in that. We've got Brother Mike Pinky here with us this morning. Boy, I appreciate him, God's man. Uh, he started a, uh, what would you call it, a rehab center? It's Redemption Point, I know. But it's like a rehab, but it's entirely faith-based. And He's down there in Blairsville. I've told him he's about him for a while, and I should pray for him. And the thing that impresses me about Matt is uh, how long How long has it been? And when did you start on building the center? Two years, and they have a center building. They ain't no feet dragging, and it's all come by God's provision. He's not taking any help or assistance from the state. They're not going to rule or say what he does. And uh, God is providing, continuing to provide. And I won't have Matt back here probably after long, probably on a Sunday morning. He's a great preacher. He's a good friend. I don't want him to share what he's doing down there. It's in Wyrville. How many men on that house? Fifteen men. And uh, I want the church to highly consider supporting that uh, because it's a very, very good thing that I know God is in. And we have seen the fruit of His works. And uh, I just ask that you pray for my and pray for all of them. We're going to sing here in a minute. Uh, Hey, we'll probably just go ahead and get the choir up there, Dickie. We'll get them up there and sing a few, but we are going to move on to service for the wedding. I ain't going to mess nothing up. I've just been trying to pray. We've got Connor O.T. with us this morning. We appreciate y'all coming out. So glad to have you. I know you've been coming back on Sunday night, and we appreciate that. Good to have you here this morning. I know that they're supposed to leave by a certain time, but we want them to hear these testimonies. We want them to hear and see and know what God can do in somebody's life. We've got several visitors here this morning. We don't want to hinder the Holy Spirit. I was thinking on that. Matt, you come on up here. I'm going to ask you to pray, and everybody will be giving this altar. But I was thinking on that, thinking on that scripture this morning, over in 2 Corinthians 3 and 17. It says, In that spirit is the Lord. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And that word liberty means freedom. Boy, we need freedom here this morning. Freedom to worship, freedom to preach, freedom to sing, freedom to praise, freedom to just be who we are in the Lord and enjoy the goodness of God. Come on, brother. I love you. Appreciate you. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, God. And we just thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in this service. Lord, we just ask you tonight, or this morning, to pour out your Spirit upon us, God. I pray this morning, if there be any that's lost in this service, God, that your Holy Spirit would come down and convict the hearts, and God would draw, and there would be salvation. And if there's any addicted this morning, God, that your deliverance would meet them here and set them free, and set the feet on a solid foundation. God, I pray for Brandon as he brings the Word this morning, that you just preach him in a mighty way, that souls be saved, disciples be made, that seeds be planted, God. Lord, we don't we don't want to be bound down in addiction. We don't want to be bound in religion or tradition, God. But we want to be set free this morning by Jesus Christ and, and just be able to serve you and have freedom and live life in life abundantly, God. Lord, we just ask you to bless this church and, and bless the servers here and the, the teachers, God. We just pray for your anointing this morning that would destroy the yoke. God, I pray for Alyssa this morning as she gives her testimony that she just remove her nerves and just be with her and 
Let your will be done this morning, God. We thank you for what you're doing in this church. And we thank you for the pastor and, and his heart to serve and to see souls saved, God. And Lord, let us just look on your cross this morning. We thank you that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. That we could be set free of our sins and forgiven and have a new life, God. And we just ask you this morning to move mightily in our hearts. We pray that you'd speak to our heart, that you'd change our lives. And that you just fill us with your spirit, that we can be free, that we can serve you. We thank you that you allow us to be the hands and feet of Jesus and coming together here this morning, God. And we just pray that you have your way and have your will. And we give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory. And we thank you for your son Jesus this morning. And all God's children said, Amen.
Somebody will come pray with you. If you want to just come and pray, we, we'll leave you alone. You know, just but if you, if you need to be saved, you need somebody to pray with you. Make a motion towards us. Let us know. Let somebody know that you need counsel. You need prayer. You need somebody to get the word of God and help you. We'll be glad to do that. If you want left alone, just pray and talk to God. I mean, I, I really don't. I'm in a place in, in my Christian life where I don't need nobody. 
in the altar with me if I, I know how to talk to God. But I, you know, I want to leave you alone and respect you. But if you need help, let us know and we'll be glad to pray with you. Uh, we've, we've done something extraordinary here this morning. And I thank you, Conway T. and all the people that got here earlier. You put some of our people out of their comfort zone. You got their seat and now they had to sit somewhere else. Yes. And I thank you for that. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we had a service one Sunday at Juneau Lusk and I've done this. Young people so stubborn, young wouldn't do it, I'd say. But I told them, I said, everybody, before, I, before we started church, I said, everybody in here, get up and go sit somewhere else. I said, get out of your seat. Go sit. I, I said, and then you'll be that much out of your comfort zone. Out of that little place where you've sat for 30 years. And boy, once you get settled in there, you love that old song, I shall not be moved. <laughs> <laughs> they get settled into their little spot on the pew where they've sat for 30 years. I'd say the invention of their hind end right there in the back. <laughs> we had these pews and this carpet clean this week, so maybe your invention's gone. <laughs> hey, we love you this morning. We sure do. I'm going to pray unless you be coming on. You want this kind of mic or you want to stand up here? Use that mic. That way you can have it. Amen. We want this blue mic cut on here this morning. All right, come on now. You're going to pray. Father, Lord, as we come before you here today, we come as humbly, Lord, as we know how. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to be in your house, Lord. And I know you've got great things in store for us here today. Lord, we love this young lady, God. We just met her a few weeks ago, but God, you just such a special place in her heart, God, through her testimony, through watching her worship. Lord, we love her hand, and God, we pray that you have your way. Lord, these altars are open. God, let people know, God, that they're here for them to use. Lord, let your spirit, God, just move over us in a, in a flood today. In Jesus' name. Love you, honey. You mind the Lord. You get nervous right here to get a bottle of water. All right? Good morning. Good morning. I'm a little nervous, but I'm out here today. And to be able to testify what the Lord has done in my life. Uh, my name's Melissa. I am 30 years old. And um, I'm no stranger to addiction. Um, I've had an addiction for a very long time. I grew up with my mother and my father who were um, in active addiction, and I have a brother and a sister. Um, through my mother's active addiction, um, she had committed a, a, a robbery, and that, that took me and my brother and my sister away from her and placed within, um, within our family. So uh, with that being done, um, you know, that... That began the root of, uh, of bitterness and of forgiveness because I didn't I didn't know what had happened and I wanted to uh, sit here and forgive me. I'm just a little nervous. <laughs> so um, with that being said, um, my brother had went to our body at a young age for some things that had happened and. Uh, my sister and I was left with a, a great aunt at that time. And over time, my sister got to stay with my great aunt, and uh, I was dropped off at, at a pool party at around six. And nobody came to pick me up. And later on in life, I had realized that um, my aunt, thinking that she was doing the best thing for me, had, um, had sold me to her boss. And I just want to add right there, if no one really believes in generational curses, um, my mother, um, at a young age, by her father, was sold to a person. And, you know, I just want to footnote there, right there, that a generational curse is a real, is a real thing. And, and it's a privilege to be able to stand up and be used by God to be a generational curse breaker so that can run out and not go on to our children, and, and that could be broken within our family. Because in Deuteron Deuteronomy 28, it talks about the blessings and the curses. And so I just wanted to say that right there, that I'm, I'm not mad at anyone, and I love each and everybody in my family. I just know when you don't have Jesus, you act out of your flesh, and that hurts people. Yeah. So uh, my mother got out of prison, and uh, she was the first child to come back home. I was uh, nine at that time. 
And when I came back home, um, there was a void there. I didn't really know how to bond with people. Um, so I loved the fact that I was back with my mom, but I really didn't know my mom. Um, so at that time, I began to, you know, it was accepted in my family for addiction and, um, and just a fast way of living. So at nine years old, I started smoking marijuana. And I didn't think that that was a bad idea because, it, you know, you can dull sin. And you say, well, if I do this, at least I'm not doing that. But that's how the enemy will get in and work in your life. And so I began to smoke marijuana. And shortly after that, um, by the age of 13, all my innocence uh, had been gone. And I, I felt I felt a sick acceptance in the world with that. Um, so... Like I said, growing up, knowing that addiction was acceptable in my family, knowing that um, no one really knew the Lord. They knew of the Lord, but they never had really surrendered and know that you can't be lukewarm. You're either sold out completely for the Lord or you're a lukewarm vessel for the enemy to work on. If you're on the fence, the enemy is on the fence, and today is the day to get off of the fence. You can't really be sold out for the Lord because he will use you. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. I've picked men and drugs over my children. I have an 11 year old daughter and I have an 8 year old son and as I look out into the crowd and I see all these kids, we need to raise our babies in the right way. We need to do what the Lord is calling us to do. We need to cry out to Him and, and we're nothing without Christ. Nothing at all. So I just really encourage that um, you know, there's no reason in my life that I can forgive these people and to really come to terms with that hurt people hurt people that came by crying out to the Lord and really knowing that that was not his will for my life and really beginning to love people the way that the Lord loves me and that he loves y'all he does not hold your past against you he does not hold your choices against you he he knows that this is the fallen world he knows that we needed a way out that's why he sent his son to die on Calvary for us if we could gain our own salvation then we would never have needed him to come and die upon that cross. So I'm here to tell you now that he loves you, he cares for you, he doesn't hold your past against you. I've hurt a lot of people in my addiction. I've hurt um, people I really cared for. I've hurt, um, I was just a mean and nasty person, and I prided myself on that because I had let the world give me an image and an identity, and, and that's what I had accepted. You know, that's how the world that's how the world will tell you that, oh, it's not so bad, you can do this and you can do that. But the truth of the matter is, if the world is leaving you alone, then I can promise you you're not doing any kingdom work. When you begin to start to really face situations after you cry out to the Lord, it's because you're a threat to the kingdom of darkness. Yes. And that's what we're called to do is cast out the kingdom of darkness. Um, I hope all that makes a little bit of sense. I feel a little bit overwhelmed right now. Um, but I'm just here to tell you that we can't do anything without the Lord holding on to our hand. Nothing at all. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, when you turn over and, and you submit, you come down and you submit to the Lord and you leave all your problems at the altar and you stand up a newborn creature in Christ, you know, a lot of people will tell you, try to trick your mind and tell you that you... You don't need to, to fix, you know, to change what you've been doing. But that's a lie. That's a lie from the enemy. And I rebuke that about that now in the mighty name of Jesus. Because every single body in this place, you have a reason of why you're here. And, you know, the Lord wants you to walk fully in His purpose. And to be an ambassador for Christ. And everybody within your, your life should be pushing you closer to Christ. I don't care what it is. If it's your job, if it's the people you see at the gas station every morning to get gas, the way that you will live your life serving the Lord will minister to people. And being called into ministry is, is really hard and it's heartbreaking. But, you know, everybody needs to know that they are loved and they are worthy. And so that's what I just say to here today and just really say that if... If my salvation, if me coming to the Lord was based on my choices, I would never have been able to be here. The Lord loves me. The Lord loves you. He cares for each and every one of us. And praise God that He doesn't leave us in our mess. But He takes our mess and He creates a message out of it. And it's to reach other people. So if you're here today and you're holding on to unforgiveness, bitterness, or you just think that what you've done is just too wrong, that you can never be forgiven, that's a lie. 
and I ask that you would move out of your comfort zone, just as, as my friend said earlier today, you got to get out of your comfort zone, and you do, because, you know, you're not going to heal in a place that you got sick at. It's all glory to God of why I stand here today. I have became homeless. I have put my addiction before each and everything in my life. I have dragged my children to pillar to post during my addiction. And I stand here today. I have my own place in my own name, and that's all glory to God. I have got my license back last month on the 21st, and I came home, and there was a brand new car sitting in my driveway that was donated through Freedom Ministries. Um, the Lord has put me in a position of leadership to uh, teach Freedom Ministries uh, Monday night from 6 to 7 in Bible-based recovery. And that's not on my strength that any of that had happened. I have a relationship with my children. They love me unconditionally. You know, and everything I had done to them, I'm not worthy to have a relationship with them. But the Lord said, yes, I do. You know, and it just reminds me of Scripture, what the enemy thought was going to be for his game. The Lord says, no, no, for my glory. So I just stand here today, and I'm just so thankful that he uses me in such a way. And he wants to use each and every one of you guys. So whatever it is that you're holding on to, if you need to go say I'm sorry to somebody, you go do it. If you need to accept the apology that you've never been given, the Lord will fight your battles. There's nothing that you have to do except for come and surrender completely to Him. So you know, and I know that the Lord has great things in store. Look what He's done. I'm one year sober. June the 11th, I'm one year sober. I would have thought you were crazy. <laughs> but the Lord loves you. He cares for you. And you know, He died for each and every one of us, but He would die had it been only you. So I just ask that. Get out of your seat. Be, do the uncomfortable thing because, yes. you know, He wants to use you. But He is a gentleman. And our free will gets in our way sometimes. So I just ask that today that we would be in obedience with Him. And I'm so thankful that he holds upon our hand and that we don't hold upon his because we let go. And I know that each and every day in the morning that his mercy and his goodness is me every day. So in the mornings I just ask that we would all just bow before the Lord and thank him for this day that he's given us. And in the evening that we would thank him for our night season and just surrender to him completely. Because that's what he wants us to do. That's what he wants us to do. And... Um, you know, also, I just feel it's on my heart. I got a phone call last night about a, somebody that had passed away. And, you know, a young person left um, their baby behind. And, and drugs don't love you, guys. Drugs don't love you at all. They don't. And the people that are feeding them to you do not love you. And what we do is really impressionable to our children and to everybody around us. So do not let the enemy attack your mind and attack your home. The Lord has entrusted us with our children and entrusted us to be boldly ambassadors for him. So I just feel the need to share that. And don't give up on anybody. You know, if, if everybody had given up on me a year ago today, I know I would have not been here today. And I didn't want to hear that a year ago, that the Lord loved me. I know that he loved me, but I felt this big to the world. You know, I wanted somebody to tell me that. That I was still worth worth it. And that I was still a mother. And I was still worthy. But at the end of the day, everybody that came to minister to me, they would point me to the Lord. And I'm thankful for that. And even though at that time that it wasn't what I wanted to hear, those were seeds that were planted. So just do unto others how you wish to be done to yourself. Yes. And put the Lord first, first and foremost. And if we do those things, I promise you, the seeds will be planted. We might not be able to see them flourish, but we know that they will be flourished. So just do what the Lord calls you to do. And I thank you very much for letting me share. Thank you. So when I was in uh, rehab, uh, Matt Pesci and Boo um, had helped me to get into rehab in New Beginning in Livonia. And um, there was a small group, and they had asked us to write a message to our addiction. 
I was at four months at this time, and um, I'll just read it to you. It says, Goodbye, Meth. Crazy relief to even see those words. There were numerous times you were all I had, or so I thought. You were my comfort, my way, and my dark, darkest cozy cover to take over the world. I fought like heck to keep you, losing my life to gain a peace size shard of you. It literally took me laying for death to come to re realize you never loved me like I loved you. And that's the moment I realized you provided no comfort, only self-hate and harm. No way towards success, success, but only to the gatekeeper of hell. You never covered me to protect, but covered me within darkness to hold me back from the light so you could use me to keep your secrets, so you could continue to lie, thief, and rob the world wrong. As your chattering noise laughed and mocked me, I've always loved you more than self, idolizing you above every and all things. Even while looking into the mirror and not noticing who I, who I was, a piece of me still couldn't let you go. I've been groomed to love not only you, but the fast life that came with you. The day I let you go was when I lost it all for you, and you never came to rescue me. I sat in a field with an empty heart, stomach, and a blackened bowl. No love for my children, for I had let them, for I had given them away. No family to come running because I bashed them and pushed them, pushed them away for you. Nobody to take from me, for there was no more to take. No more men, for I had been sexually used and abused, misunderstanding of love. I had nothing but a false reality and a laughing stock to my so-called friends. Once there was no more to give and nothing more to take, I looked around and I seen what I had become. It was never God's will for me to put myself through so much pain. That shows my ignorance I had for you. My determination, that sickness, is long gone and changed over for the kingdom of God. Devil, you lost your hold on me. God has me and will never let me go. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, you are bound and rendered helpless. I am covered by the blood, and I thank you, Lord, with no remorse. Oh. Sorry, Alyssa. <laughs> and you get you get clean don't make you saved. We, we live in a time in a society where, where everybody's basing their salvation upon a bright light or, they're, or they're, they're basing it upon when they come through something in life or because they've come through a healing in their life they think they're saved. And that's just not true. Even Satan himself can transform himself into an angel of life. I think about the word lost. If you go and you turn in your Bible, this is not what we're preaching. I want to paint a picture of your in your mind of what a lost, a sinner looks like. Luke chapter 15. It says, What woman having ten pieces of silver, if she doesn't light the candle, begin to sweep the house, to see diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she goes to her friends. They begin to rejoice and they and they joy in the presence of the angels of heaven. You must not I'm really convinced this is what this means. I really believe that the woman is the bride of Christ. That you must understand that when you are born again and you have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and He has called you out of your darkness and into the light when you've been covered by the blood. You must understand that your state as a sinner, you are stuck. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think the woman as she began to sweep, I think the broom represents the Holy Ghost. It comes through the house of God. It begins convicting hearts. And it's from faith to faith. And it goes from one to the other. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. The candle represents the light that we hold high. It says in Him is life. And that life is the light of men. What does that mean? It means that when that light shines in on your dark state, that your darkness can comprehend it not. It drives those little sickness and disease of the sinner out. It will drive the addiction out of your life. You don't have to wonder today if you've been born again. Amen. The, but you look at the coin. You begin to look at the coin. You look that it's stuck. The coin is dirty. The old sin and the stain that comes from that sin, it begins to be we're stained by it. You're born into it. You can't escape. The Bible teaches man that is that born of a woman is what? A few days and full of trouble. You know the thing is, is it's easy. We are born bad. Let's just be real. We better hang out that we're born that way. Yeah. We're born that way. But if you've been come through the blood of Christ, you've chewed the same dirt I have, whether it be on a smaller scale or not. But you look at the corn. You listen to the old devil, nobody loves you. You think about everybody that's cast you aside. You may be an outcast. And you know that Jesus received the sinners and He said, the Bible says that He eats with them. Know that that coin never lost its value. Yeah. The coin was still worth something even though it was covered up in dust. It was lost and stuck in a dark place. But when the, when the Holy Ghost begins to deal with your heart, you ain't got to wonder who's a knocking. You say, I've never felt that before. Or maybe you felt it. You begin to knock your life. Thinking, what are they going to think if I walk the aisle again? Let's just let it hang out today. Buddy, if you can't be real in church, where can you be real yeah. at? Yeah. I might be, oh, I sing in the choir. What are they going to think? I teach Sunday school. What are they going to think? Matter of fact, what are you going to think when you stand before Him one day? In Matthew 7, they begin confessing their words. Lord, have we, have I not done this in Your name? Right. But you look at that coin and you begin to understand that, that you need a, a real, something real in your life. You need a Savior in your life. You need Jesus in your life. Whether it's a name that's cast out in vain that's come through your household. Maybe it's just you cast Him aside. I don't need that. I hear about this. I see these people treat me like this. Well, maybe they ain't never been perfected in love either. My testimony is this. At an early age, 19... 20 some were not good, good with dates. I took a pill that led me down a 13 year path of destruction. I began crushing pills. I began to put them up my nose. I'm going to be real, preacher. I'm going to be real with you today. And I, as, as I begin that, it, it began like the, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye began to come into my life. And that, that turned into the methadone. But if there's a clinic in this town, it will not liberate you. It will not set you free. It may get you off the streets. But you must know this. Jesus says, come to Me. Through, through all of that, through the addiction and neglecting of my family, honey, raise your hand. My wife never left me through all these years. You must understand something, love. you got to understand something. It's just like this. One thing goes to another. Then it turns to another. Before you know it, I'm addicted to a needle. An eight ball habit a day. I would rob you mine. I was good at stealing. I'd work all day. I'd steal all night. This is what I come from. An eight ball a day. I've got scars from the bases of my toes to the end of my fingers. And amongst my addiction, as if it ain't bad enough, I was diagnosed with a cancer. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, closed B cell. It was as big as a grapefruit. It was attached to my heart, my carotid artery, and in my lungs. Now, in amongst that condition, what did, what would you think? Nobody loves me. God help me. Nobody cares for me. It doesn't matter how far in sin you are. Jesus is your answer. Jesus is that answer. So you begin to think about, I'm sitting in a hospital, they gave me nitroglycerin pills. My chest is pushed out. I'm doing an eight ball of dope a day. 
I go to the hospital, I refuse to give a drug test because you know what they're going to say. They give me a nitroglycerin pill. It doesn't take it away. Let's give you a CAT scan. The woman, she ran in. And I'll never forget the look on her face. She big old tears. She looked at me. She says, "We found the mass in you, in, inside of you, right here." And the woman couldn't even keep her composure. She she blows out of the hospital room. At that state, I'm thinking, "Lord." So, in amongst that, my life goes from complete chaos to a worse chaos. I get news that doctors say that you might as well get on disability. You'll never work again. You'll, you'll never be able to go back to work. You'll always, basically, you'll always be a cripple. Makes me think about Ephesians. It says, but, but God. You know what that word in rich in mercy actually means? It means that He has a peace towards you today. Men and women that are at a miserable state. Mercy is what you need in your life. Grace is what you need in your life. So my addiction turned even harder. I didn't work. I continued to steal. I continued to lie. I continued manipulating my family. I was abusive to my family. My kids didn't like me. My kids would hide in closets because I was I almost caught what you say demonic. It's the, the life choices that I made. Choices in a bed that I made to lay in. Knowing that at nine years old I walked an aisle. Professing Christ. First Titus, First Titus 16 says this. It says that many or people profess God, but in their works they are abominable, disobedient, every good work they're a reprobate. I think we have a profession problem and not a possession problem. I think that it's not I, but Christ lives in me. What does Paul say? He says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He says, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by what? The faith of the Son of God who loved me and He gave Himself for me. I never knew that verse. I never knew that there was a therefore if any man's in Christ, he's what? He's a new creature. Creation. That old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new in your life. I like the next part too. And for that all things are of God. And He's given us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. Bringing people to Christ. I was leading people to hell. I never was a follower. I was a leader of the pack. Follow me for a good time. I'll give you one. In amongst all that, I started chemo. I've got scars here from my port. I began shooting the dope through my port. I thought, well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die the way I want to. I'm going to go out with a bang. I'm going to go out with a pop. You know, I'm going to go out just... Nobody loves me. The devil had me convinced that you're no good. Nobody loves you. But you do know that for God so loved what? He loved the world. That He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but what? Have everlasting life. And that God sent forth what? Not His Son into the world to what? To condemn you. Condemn the world. But the world through Him might be saved. Amen. And amongst all of that, I know what the oppression of the enemy does. I know what the chatters and the voices through the midnight hours are. I know what it's like to watch the sun come up and sweat rolling down your face and you feeling depressed and you feeling oppressed and from the cancer you can't eat nothing. I know what it's like to throw up blood. I know what it's like to lay in a hospital with staff telling the doctor say that you ain't going to make it. You might as well call in the family. He will not make it through the night. I know what it's like God reached down and say, I've got a plan for your life. And He has a plan for yours today. If you'll submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says repent and believe the Gospel. What's that word mean? It means turn from your ways. I'm going back to Blairsville. Now I'm going across the dragon's hell. You turn from a life of sin. You turn to a life of God. And you call out on His name. It says any man that comes to him, what? He will in no wise cast him out. I don't believe in a limited atonement. I believe in a full atonement because it's in His will that all should come to the same in faith and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. All! So amongst all that, the Lord had 
mercy in my life. The Lord began to heal me of a cancer. God had put Matt Pinky in my life. He says, you ain't got to live this way. We need more people to get out into the highways, into the hedges, and tell them that God loves them and He has a plan for your life. But you must just tell you right now, inviting people to church is not spreading the gospel. Spreading the gospel is saying that He died for your sin. And whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I like what that word... You know what the word sin means in my opinion? It means that you're missing the mark. But as hard as you try to reach a place in your life, it's like pulling back a bow. we got hunters in here, don't we? You pull back that bow to never hit the target. It's missing of the mark. You not get on your merit. You won't come in on your wife. You won't come in on your husband. Just because your preacher's a good preacher, it won't come in because of him. It's because the Holy Ghost has brought you out of sin. And you the works have been brought to that life. We have people thinking I've been saved. I met a boy yesterday says I'm an atheist and I pointed straight to a tree. I says, what created that tree? He says, Mother Earth. I says, who created the dirt? He says, well, I don't know. I says, I believe in the beginning. God created all things. That little old boy was glued to me. I said, God pulled me out of an addiction. Called me son. Picked me up out of the miry clay. He inclined his ear to my cry. And he answered me. You think about something. Saved from what? Do you know what you're saved from? Yes. And what you are saved to? Think about it. So in amongst all of that, I'm just going to leave this hanging with all kinds of thoughts. That's all right. So you think about something. The Lord had mercy. I began to get healing in my life through the cancer. I turned even more bitter because God chose to heal me. I was in a place in my life. I hated everybody, including myself. I was full of pride. It was all about Brandon or nothing. What can Brandon get? Where can Brandon go? How many airheads Brandon can find? How many chicken houses can I rob? And who can I take down with me? I've done a lot of things in my life. I'm actually seeing people that I've introduced to the drug. They're sitting in prison today because I made bad choices to give it to them. Because I wanted a friend. Let me tell you something. Misery loves company in your life. Misery will always attract. Misery. It attracts the kind of people you don't need to be around. And when you get out and you go back, it's craziness. Every time let me tell you something, if you've been clean and you ain't been saved, you better repent and believe the gospel. What does the Bible say when a house is clean and them old spirits come back? He brings seven more even wicked than the first. This is real. Lord began to heal me. Matt kept on. There's a better way. There's a better way. Tell me about your salvation. It used to make me mad. Let me tell you something. These people that are love sick saying we don't need to offend somebody. If it's for the gospel sake, you can stand on it. Jesus, there's a better way. Are you sure you're saved? The Christian life looks like this. You look like this. I wanted to kick him out of the truck. I got asked to go to a faith-based program. Two years Matt poured into me. It's, you know one thing that we all contributed to that cross? And that was the sin necessary to put in there. Yeah. All for nothing to my salvation. Nothing at all. Because God loves people. Contrary to what you've been hurt. On this side of things, God loves people. The wrath of God will say is stored up for the day of wrath. Yeah. I got to a faith-based program. I'd gotten my place in my life that my wife was leaving me. I did not care. I did not care. The law was looking for it for me. He's looking for my brother. They're, you know, my life was crazy. Complete chaos. And I thought it was normal. A normal day. The only thing I knew is run from the law. Because they'll put you in jail. Anybody else? Tough luck. I got to a place in my life. Listen, this right here. I says, God, if I'm not saved, I want to know that I'm saved. Yeah. Lord, if it's real, I want it. Yeah. I want what I hear about. I want to hear and taste and see that the Lord is good. I want to be saved. 
If there is such a thing about a week went long, I was sitting in a white church in Beckley, West Virginia, and the Holy Ghost spoke through my head, and it come down into my heart. And when He spoke to me, I want to tell you something. There was no need to know who it was. From the weight of my own sin, I was crushed in a church, and I run out the back door, and there's an old boy standing there. He says, well, for what you know, what do you want? And it's like my eyes open. Lord, be merciful me a sinner. God, save me and fix my life. Lord, I know that You're real. I will live for You. But God, I want You to fix this mess. And when I got up, I went down the beggar and I come up for thee. And yes, it's just like that. Next thing I know, three days later, I'm running people down in the parking lot thinking, Lord, help. Let me tell you about somebody that saved me. I don't know a whole lot about it, but where I was blind, I now see. I know that I'm free. But here's the thing. It don't just stop with salvation. That's actually just the, the starting point. You know, God don't leave you a broken mess. And not far from it. <clears throat> Since then, my wife and I, our marriage has been had restoration. See, you know, see, God cares is in the big things just as much as the small things. He's the God of reconciliation. He's the God of restoration. He's the God that takes broken things and He makes them whole. He don't just make them well. He makes them whole again. And since then, I'll give you a quick testimony about a cop and I'm going to get into the Word. But uh, the cop that chased me and my brother 13 years. Okay? I kept him fighting in the church. I come back from rehab three weeks later. Of course, everybody in doubt, you'll never make it, you'll never make it. And I said, no, you don't understand. He gave me a dose of something I'll never forget. He made the old things new. And I got an answer to go home. And I got my brother to go to West Virginia. He's like, I've been saved. I says, no, you haven't. Yeah. We don't act like that when we're saved. Amen. Next thing you know, in, the, in my mom and dad's house, I'm a preaching to him and I ain't even been called yet. I'm like, Lord, it just blurted out. Three months later, Lord, you can't. Anyways, they called me to preach. I answered the call. I'd run all I wanted to run. I want to run too. Who saved me? I wanted to taste and see how much more the Lord is good. I wanted a relationship with Him. I had a desire to read the Word. I began to read the Word and understand. I'm like, Lord, the first thing I ever read is a city that's set up on a hill cannot be hid. Who lighted the candle and put it under? Nobody does that. I understood it. I thought, wow. I kept biting this old cop. He was a detective. He just didn't like us. I'll be honest with you. We got one of the thickest books in Union County on the rap sheet of anybody else. Me and my brother did. So anyways, I kept him biting him. I kept him biting I stayed on him. I stayed on him. And I got asked to preach in a revival. It's a cross worship center. Just so happened he showed up on the day I preached. And I'll tell you what I preached. I preached John chapter 19. By his stripes that we are healed and what they meant. And I watched a six foot three man come barreling down the altar. And I'll tell you what, the Holy Ghost got a hold of him that day. He come down to an altar. He says, I'm saved. He got born again that day. Now he stands and he preaches Today. Glory to God. All right, if you got your Bibles, turn to Luke 17. We're going to talk about the lepers today. I'm going to read. We'll see if the Lord takes off. If not, then I'll sit down and we'll have all the Start in verse 11. And when it came to pass, he went to Jerusalem. And he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him, why don't you listen to this through here? There met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show thy yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back with a loud voice 
glorified God. He fell down on His face and at His feet, giving Him thanks. And when He was a Samaritan, and Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? I ask you today, I have a thought before we go in. Father, are you part of the one or are you part of the nine? you got to understand. Let's just finish reading. And there are not found that return to give Him glory to. God saved this stranger and He said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith has made you whole. Yeah. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray over the Word of God. Lord, we pray that it wouldn't fall on deaf ears today. It's not a brand new way, it's a Bible way. Father, we pray the name of Jesus will be lifted high today. Father, You said if I be lifted up, I will begin to draw all men unto me. Father, I pray that You draw them to an altar. I pray that they reach out for mercy. And Lord, if they don't move today, I pray they not sleep at night. I pray they not eat at night. I pray that You would do what only You can do, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. You gotta understand when Jesus come through this town, they were tense. They're outcasts. They couldn't go to their families. Boy, ain't how that drugs does. It's just like this right here. The leprosy was a, a disease or a skin issue as it would start in a spot. Yeah. It would start in a spot on the skin or up under the eyelid. But notice how as sin continues in your life and it reigns in your body, I assure you, if you've never been saved, if you've never been saved, I'll just tell you like it is. You are lost and you're in bondage. It makes me think about John chapter 8. Jesus got done telling me, He says, I am the light of the world. I like those seven I am. He told Martha, He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. And He says, I am the light of the world. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father except by Him. So we look at Jesus, the Anointed One, the Savior of the world. He comes by. And these people cry out to Him. The thought today is only one was saved out of the ten. But nine, all ten were healed, but only one was saved. You find that word whole. You can translate that word back to Romans chapter 10. That whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He had a saving faith that day. I really believe that we said in churches all across America that people had to had that old healing or something take place in their life. And they believe they really have what it takes in the enter the kingdom of God. I really believe as those nine, they never gave a praise to Him. As they went, they seen that they were healed. But there's something about that tenth leper. Yeah. As he saw he was healed, there was a spirit of gratitude begin to rise yeah. up in him. And I promise you, if you've ever been a beggar and you've been on the streets and hung out in sin, when you've been touched by God, you will raise your hands. It's not if you want to gospel. You will want to talk about Jesus. You will want to do the things He says you call me Lord. But how come you don't do the things that I command you? He's the one that spoke out in those centurion. And He said, what? He said, there's never been a man spake like this. Man. There's something different about this leper. He had a spirit of gratitude. And I really believe it's God brings restoration in our lives. I didn't know what it looked like. But all I know is I've been touched by the Lord. I know that I've been living in sin. I had come out of a dark place. And I've been brought into that light. And my deeds have been reapproved. Yeah. We ought to raise our hands if you've been saved today. I ain't coming to beat you over the head. But you must know that heaven, it can be your home if it ain't already today. You must know He inhabits the praises of us. He is, he is high and lifted up as Isaiah said. I think about the book of Revelation. It says His voice is as a sound of many waters. I think about His head and His heart was white as snow. I think about the eyes of a flame of fire. You know what? He's the one that sits upon that great white throne one day when people don't know Him that will meet Him. I think about He's called the Son of God. He's called the Lily of the Fountain. Yeah. He's the bright morning star. He's all you'll ever need. He's the promised seed in the book of Genesis. He's our high priest in Leviticus 16. Oh, He's the wisdom in the Proverbs. Oh, do you know who I talk about today? He's the King. He's high. He's mighty. But you think about the one left was the only one that was saved. 
It brought restoration to His life. I begin to think it's the body parts. And the, the sin is compared in parallel to that sin. Things begin to fall out of His life. Something's not right in my life. The outcast, he could never see his family. He couldn't go to work. They eat whatever they could find off the street. Think about something. Everywhere they went, they'd have to holler, unclean! Unclean! Makes me think about the woman with the issue of blood. She couldn't be isolated from her family. What does that look like? She couldn't go to the marketplace. She couldn't go to the grocery store. Buddy, if you're hung out in sin today, you feel that way at times. But there's a place up here at this hour. You call out on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. You must know that there's none righteous. No, not one. You must know that your righteousness is a filthy rag. That we've all sinned and we've all come short of the glory of God. And for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And God committed His love towards us. And while we were yet sinners, He died for you. But you think it looks like something far away. Bible teaches us in Romans 10 that the word is even nigh in my mouth. <clears throat> From the heart, the man believe unto righteousness. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If there's no conviction, there's no transformation. The Holy Ghost must be dealing with your heart. You look at that lost coin, it is stuck until it's found in a dark place. If you know that, you would run to an altar day and you'd dig your heels into an altar and you'd realize your state and you'd call out on His name. You may not know what it looks like. I can't pray like that preacher. He hears what your heart has to say. The Bible says that He don't desire your sacrifices but a broken and contract spirit. He desires that crushed heart. Call upon Him today while He is there. So I begin praising the Lord. What's faith? Faith, substance, things hope. I got something for it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You know what the word evidence means? It means convicting. The convicting of things not seen when the preacher stands to preach and it begins to deal with your heart. That's the Lord knocking on your heart. Come unto me if you labor and have you laid in the day. He says, I'll give you that rest. Has restoration ever come back in your life? There's something wrong. Something wrong. So are you the nine or are you the one? The nine never turned around to give him a praise. They had a physical healing. Saved in faith was to the one. He recognized him as Lord. He was made whole. Not just well, he was complete. He was made whole. I think about the man with the withered hand in Mark chapter 3. It says the scribes and the Pharisees, as Jesus walked up in the temple. I want to show you about the power of hidden things in our lives. The man with the withered hand. He was in amongst, he was in amongst the place of worship. And the, the scribes the, notice that Jesus always comes against the traditions of men. He says, it's not written in your law. Your law. Your law. They could never keep their own law. They tie heavy burdens around people's necks. Let me tell you something. If somebody's doing that you today, that ain't the will of the Father for your life. He says, my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. Jesus come up in there and they described. They said, hoping they could see Him do something to take a hill on the Sabbath. One thing they brought against Him on the cross of the crucifixion. This man held on the Sabbath day. This man claims to be God. He was God all wrapped up in flesh that the works of the devil in your life might be destroyed. But this man had a red hand. He couldn't use it. When Jesus said arise, it means to awake. It means to awake out of a sleep or a slumber. That old man had that old hand. And I really believe it was when it was withered, it was of no use. He says, stretch forth that hand. He didn't give him his good hand. He knew exactly what he was talking about today. The Lord's dealing with your heart. You really know what you need. I don't care how many times you've walked this all. I don't care how many times you profess. Just get it right before you leave this side of things. But the Lord said, stretch it forth. It's not in your ability to save yourself. It's to put your faith in Jesus Christ. If He's calling you out today, you don't have what it takes. He's wanting to say, I love you. He's wanting to pick you up like the old prodigal son. But Jesus said, Oh, you must 
get a picture of what he looks like. People that say he beats you down, that's so far from a lie. It said that he was looking for him a long ways off. The love of the Father, He embraces Him. He gives Him the best road. Maybe you're backslidden like the sheep. And He's drawing you back up here. Notice that He embraces you with His hands. He loves you today. God was going to get us all home back Amen. The lies that you believe are from straight from the devil. The Bible says that He is the Father of life. Understand in John chapter 8 is the old people, they look down and they talking to Jesus. Jesus looked down. Don't you get a hold of this right here. He says, I'm no. He said, well, first He says, the truth, when you come to know the truth, the truth will set you free. But notice when He goes on down, it's not reading a science book that makes you free. The Bible says, yeah, therefore, if the Son shall therefore make you free, yeah. you shall be free indeed. Yeah. And old people look down at Him and says, we've never been in bondage to no man. Yeah. That's a lie too because yeah. they were up under the power of Rome. They have been led through the deliverance of the Red Sea. Why do you think Jesus, when He broke that donkey that no man ever sat, he rode her through the street. You know what that means? When they said, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. It means Jesus, save us now. When they waved them palm leaves, you know what that represented? It means that they were oppressed. Maybe you're oppressed today. They said, we've never been in bondage to no man. Let me tell you something, honey. If you've never been saved, you need Jesus today. He says, well, if you were the children, the children of Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham. Right. That's something to think about today. I ask you today, are you kingdom minded? Are you really free today? Are you really free? It ain't, don't lie to yourself because you ain't lying to him. Your heart's open in him today. You can lie to the preacher all you want to. You can lie to a spouse. Let me tell you something. God's all about restoration. He likes our praise and I like to praise. I'm done. If you don't know Him today, if you don't know who I'm talking about, maybe you say my life don't look like yours. But you, you, you'll know, you'll know if the Lord's dealing with you today. Maybe the Lord's telling you get out of an aisle. These little cues are tight, but let me tell you something. The Lord's telling you get out of the queue. You walk out aisle. I'll rejoice with you as you walk down. I'll cheer for you. Maybe there needs to be one added to the kingdom of God today. That they be presence in all of the angels in heaven. Yes. What do you need today? Be real with yourself today. And lay it at the feet of Jesus. I love you, Lord. 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 I I Oh. 
I thank God for what He's done here today. And I want to be honest. I know God is they ain't no little fraction of what God could do or what God wanted to do when I'm here today. That's because of rebellion and pride and stiff nakedness and a cold heart and indifferent on God and lukewarm Christianity. And we hold back or hinder the hand of God from being able to do what God wants to do in our life. Amen. Praise God. I love you, Brantley. <laughs> Brandon, I love you, son. What preaching? What a testimony. Unless I love you, honey. Thank God for you to come and be in with us. What's your name, sister? Boy, I appreciate you. Amen. What a blessing. Praise the Lord. Miss Holly. Praise God. We appreciate you being here with us tonight. If anybody got anything on their heart from God, it's from the Lord, and you feel like you need to say it. I'm talking about something burning from God, something real, genuine. Do you mind the Lord? I want to thank the Lord for saving me. Praise the Lord. Anybody else here this morning? Go ahead, man. I want to thank God for taking chances. <laughs> Woo! Lord. Anybody else? Find the Lord. Find the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Boy, I have thoroughly enjoyed this service today. How good it's been to be in the house of God. Amen. Wonderful. Anybody else, you mind the Lord? <laughs> <laughs>